it is the greatest show on earth. There's something about policing that kind of draws you to it. That's almost the sort of the secret source to it all, is that everybody has their reason for doing it. Some people don't even know their reason until they've done it. When people say, thank you for your service, all of that kind of stuff, don't forget, I got a huge amount out of it. Then I looked down at the, the, the man who was having the heart attack and he was, just, he was just kind of just looking up at me and his eyes were, and he just grabbed my hand and he squeezed my hand. I've been lucky because you can be at the wrong place at the, at the wrong time. One of my uh, colleagues back in the day at Gravesend was stabbed uh, and it was his vest that saved him. The special constabulary ultimately, uh, you can put it in many different ways, but is exactly the same as the regular force, but with no payment, volunteers, um, kind of part-time, if you want to call it that way. You've got to do 16 hours a month minimum. Um, and it's made up of all walks of life. So some people do it for the scouts, some people do it for the lifeboats, some people do it for St John's Ambulance, lots of people do it for you know charities, um, dog shelters, etc, etc. We just happen to do it from a policing standpoint. I think I genuinely have the best of both worlds. Welcome to More Than The Badge, a Kent Police podcast. My name is Natalie Hardy and I will be your host today. Today's episode is with Special Inspector Terry Connolly. Terry has volunteered for Kent Police for 30 years and is an integral part of our roads policing unit. Welcome to the podcast, Terry. Thanks for having me. What inspired you to join the Special Constabulary? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think inspiration's a big word, isn't it? It could it conjures up this like moment where you go, ah, that. Uh, I don't think it was like that for me. I'm the youngest of three, uh, and I'm the youngest considerably by about 16 years. And so my uh, sister, who is the eldest, um, she uh, she met a guy, and he was in the police cadets when they met, and then he became a PC in the Met. And then by the time I was sort of a toddler, I'm just getting old, they were going out. And so I grew up with his stories because he would come back from his shift normally to our house uh, oh, to see amazing. her. So I grew up on all of his kind of stories about what he'd done that particular day. Everything from quite boring stuff to quite ugh, stuff to wow, that's exciting stuff. Um, so I don't know if that inspired me, but it was certainly kind of in my head I guess all the way through my late childhood and then your early teens and I was going to join the Metropolitan Police which is he was part of um, and I just finished my A-levels and you had to be 18 and a half so I was doing a part-time job uh, and I thought that's what I want to do and I got invited to their selection weekend uh, and then my mum trod my foot and she uh, caused an ingrowing toenail which then caused an infection which then meant I couldn't do the fitness and I was terrified of failing the fitness uh, I was a lot slimmer then. I probably wouldn't have failed the fitness, um, but I thought I would. So I kind of deferred. They were very kind. They said I had a year so I could get myself kind of sorted. And in that year, my career, albeit at a very young age, started to go quite quickly and started to develop. So I had to kind of put the police on the back burner because I was really loving what I was doing. Um, and then sometime later, some four or five years later, I'd done quite well and I got my weekends back. And uh, one of, uh, I was an area manager at the time, and one of my team in our Folkestone store actually was a special in Kent. And I'd kind of ruled out specials because I thought Fates Carnival's not interested. You either do, do it properly or you don't do it. Uh, and he was telling me all the stuff he got up to in Kent. And then the thing that sealed it, he went, is there a fitness test? He went, no. <laughs> and I was, perfect, I'll apply. Um, and the rest, as they say, is kind of history. So you've got your mum to thank then? I mean, I don't know if I thank her, but yes, I probably would thank her. So for people who don't know, what is the Special Constabulary? Great question. So the Special Constabulary ultimately, uh, you can put it in many different ways, but is exactly the same as the regular force, but with no payment, volunteers, um, kind of part-time, if you want to call it that way. You've got to do 16 hours a month minimum. Um, and it's made up of all walks of life and pretty much, you know, a lot of the people have a day job as well. So they're doing their regular paid employment and they come out to kind of volunteer, whether it's the weekends, whether it's evenings, whether it's daytimes, whatever works for them. Uh, and they wear the same uniform 
Uh, they have the same powers. Um, you can pretty much, certainly in Kent, you can pretty much be in almost every department, bar a few, um, that our regular colleagues do, and kind of do the same job, but just doing it kind of on, on, on a part-time basis. So, so you're doing it for free, so you must love what you're doing. You know, and, and that's volunteering, right? So some people do it for the scouts, some people do it for the lifeboats, some people do it for St John's Ambulance, lots of people do it for, you know, charities, um, dog shelters, etc., etc. We just happen to do it from a policing standpoint. And so I think, yeah, you know, you, you there's something about policing that kind of draws you to it. And for some people, but like it was for me, it was this kind of long drawn out thing. For others, it's a moment or a situation where they think, I want to do something, you know. Um, and I think that's that's the beauty of it. That's almost the sort of the secret source to it all is that everybody has their reason for doing it. Some people don't even know their reason until they've done it. If I had joined the regulars, the traffic department is where I'd have probably wanted to, to spend some time. And I never thought we'd get that opportunity as a special constable. But so roads policing, uh, white hats, motorways, big roads, crashes, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but if we were to kind of segment it into, you know, what the force would understand it to be and what the public would want, denying criminals the use of the road. Not all drivers are criminals, but most criminals drive. So, you know, using our legislation, particularly around roads, road safety, uh, is important. Uh, then you've got preventing people from being killed or seriously injured on the roads. So kind of the fatal four. So if you're thinking use of mobile phones, most people understand. Speed is kind of a big one. Uh, drink and drug driving, you know, drug driving becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, and then fundamentally, in a quite an innocuous one, but responsible for so many deaths that are needless, putting your seatbelt on, you know. And so from a roads policing standpoint, I think it's one of the best departments in the force. I am biased, but the reason I think that is Whatever kind of strand of operational frontline policing you are in or you're interested in, roads policing gives you the opportunity to do that with the best vehicles we've got, uh, the, some of the best training that we've got, and to work with some of the best people we've got. So whatever it is you kind of want to do, if you like getting hold of burglars, bizarrely, roads policing can absolutely do that. If you want to prevent people being killed or seriously injured, Roads policing can absolutely do that. Pretty much whatever there is that's out there operationally, roads policing can be a part of that. And how has your career evolved since you've been with Kent Police? Well, it's my single employer, if is the best way I can put it, even though I'm not technically employed. Uh, so I've done this for 29 years, 30 years next year. Uh, in my career, my day job, I've obviously hopped from employer to employer, like many people, but Kent police has kind of been my longest single employer so I started out as a special constable in 1995 at Gravesend uh, uh, back in the day where we had lots of kind of individual police stations in individual towns um, I think back then you kind of had two groups of specials you kind of had those who really liked the fates and the carnivals and all of that kind of stuff uh, and then you had the people who just wanted to be out on the street on a Friday and a Saturday night and getting stuck in was that you there's a possibility that that was more me um, but you had to do both and that was kind of the game uh, but what I learned was the people that really kind of specialized in the second bit that were getting stuck into all of the day job stuff really also excelled in the fates and the carnivals because typically the fates and the carnivals didn't really have any problems but when they did you needed to take control much as you might do on a Friday or Saturday night so if you had that experience it was very easy to move into that. Whereas colleagues who maybe didn't have that sometimes were a little bit shell-shocked by what was going on. It took some time to register what was happening. And that's quite common for anybody who first joins uh, the police. I would say the special constabulary, but I think the police, particularly if you've, if you've never been in any form of confrontation, sometimes you can't believe <laughs> that something's happening in front of you and it takes you a moment to register it and then react. Whereas in those situations, because we'd kind of been out on the nighttime economy stuff, we just, You're prepared. Just prepared you know, and, and kind of reacted. It. So I spent 14 years at Gravesend, um, and I was just coming to the that 14th year. And if I'm really honest, I was getting a little bit bored with it all. I had done everything we could do um, as specials, at least at that point, in operational local policing. I had great relationships with lots of people, 
but I was kind of, there was something missing and I didn't know I didn't know what it was. And I was just starting to think about, is this for me anymore? And you were still doing your regular job oh, at yeah, that yeah. time. Still so. do the day job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then a deputy officer, a deputy chief officer at the time came along and held a meeting as he would periodically do with us all. And um, he said, oh, we're going to start up a, a kind of division of specials on traffic, on roads policing. And I was couldn't believe my ears. And I, and I said to my colleague, um, who bizarrely now works for Roads Policing, uh, I said to him, I'm going to do that. And he was like, why are you going to do that? Like, you, you kind of, everybody knows you're here. You can get what you need. You can do what you want. Why would you do that? And I said, because that, A, I would have loved to have done that as a, as a, as a regular officer. But B, the thing that I feel like I'm missing to do this job better is the ability to drive, response driving, blue light driving to most people. Uh, and I think if any, if that will ever come, because back in the day we could only drive a car from A to B, and actually it was fairly late in that that we were suddenly allowed to stop a vehicle, um, you couldn't you couldn't go to a, a job on response because you weren't trained, and rightly so. Um, I thought it will come for them because that's the core part of the roads policing role is driving. I said, so A, I've always wanted to do it, and B, it kind of fits with what I'd like to do next. Lots of people told us, or told me, <laughs> It won't work. You'll be the third in crew. Uh, they won't train you. They won't. They won't want you there. You know. Oh, so there's quite a negative opinion there yep. among yep. your team. Yep. Mm. Absolutely. Because it's change, and it's fear, and that's all quite normal. You know. But you wanted that challenge. Oh, without question. Well, you've got to be in it to win it. But I also think at my day job and and developing my career, my day job. I'd seen all of this before. It's just different. You know, it's departmentally different, the company's different, but all the relationships, all the behaviours, all people's worries, all their fears, that's all the same. It doesn't mm. change. Just the badge changes. Um, and I kind of knew that, as I'd learned in the 14 years as a special, when you spend eight or ten hours in a car with someone, you will get on, you know, and you will build a relationship, and you do that one person at a time. And then before long, you know, in a, in a, in a team of ten officers... You've worked with most of them. And of course, they talk when you're not there. So the relationship you've built uh, permeates beyond you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you look for those opportunities to get stuck into things. You look for the opportunities to take a load off them earlier. You look for the opportunity to do the rubbish job that saves them doing it. Because you know that that's going to build your reputation. And as a consequence, I kind of thought, if 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 there's if they are in any way the same as most human beings, and I think they are, this will this will work, this will work, and so and it did. It, well, yes, it did work. Tell me about the training when you first started out. What was the training like? It was pretty basic, but it was of its time. So it was a lot of kind of home study, and you really had a weekend, uh, arresting people, uh, stop and search, um, and kind of a. A view, I think, of the, the force on you around what's your judgment like? Do you do you look kind of someone that we can kind of train and you're going to go out there and not be a liability? Um, if you look at it today, my Lord, it's like completely the opposite. So now I think it's six months worth of training. I think it's more or less like getting trained like a regular officer. In fact, you can now transfer from the specials directly into the regulars. So it's it's completely different so your officer safety training that you get your first aid training that you get a lot of training around kind of your judgment and situations the national decision model all of that it is night and day um, and so whilst you'll never feel the moment you step out ready because you never do you are so much more ready than I guess we were kind of back in the day um, so yeah it's it's kind of second to none now and how has the safety equipment changed for example well, as specials, we, particularly in Kent, we have our kind of own personal issue equipment, which sounds kind of obvious, but not a lot of other forces do. So our own kind of um, ballistic and stab protection vests, uh, our own parva spray, incapacitant spray, our own batons, um, and our own cuffs. Uh, and we've got officers now who are actually trained in taser. Um, and whilst they draw taser the same as everybody else, Again, obviously they carry that on every single shift. So from an equipment standpoint, uniform standpoint, you know, you probably wouldn't know the difference unless you knew really what you were looking for. 
you wouldn't know the difference between the special constable and the regular just in terms of appearance. So Rose Policing, that's a specialist area. Are there any others that you can work in? Yeah, so in Kent, uh, again, we're incredibly lucky. Um, we have our search and marine unit uh, and we put people through kind of the same training as our regular colleagues, uh, powerboat courses, etc. Um, we have our uh, dogs unit. Um, so we have uh, teams working with the, with the dog section. We have uh, teams on our special branch, um, or in special branch, I should say. Um, uh, we've got um, volunteers in policing from a mounted perspective. Uh, so there's a huge amount. And then we also get the ability um, to be instructors uh, for certain things. So well, one of my colleagues um, is a public order instructor. Uh, so he works training uh, specials and regulars when, um, is, when he's required uh, in public order tactics. Uh, I do uh, driver training. So I help to train people, um, specials and regulars sometimes, with standard response. So blue light driving, the kind of the first level of that. Um, and that's, that's been a dream come true. That's not even a dream come true. I don't think you know, I would have even dreamt that. Um, and, I, you know, got a huge thanks to the force um, for kind of investing in me. It, it took a long time, um, but without, without the forces backing, without my colleagues at driver training, without my RPU colleagues, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, and that's great because it prevents us having to take a, a training resource from our regular colleagues uh, to train specials to do that. Um, but we're all the product of that because it sort of began that way. Um, so I can train specials now to do that. Um, and obviously, I'm free, they're free. Um, and yes, we invested in the training, but that kind of gives back time and time again. So, you know, a huge amount of things you can specialize in, but when you join, just be good at policing first, and then you can do the other stuff. And over the 30 years, how have you found finding the time to do this? So what's interesting is, and I wouldn't have known this in the first five years, um, but we have people from all walks of life. So uh, we've got investment bankers, we've got train drivers, we've got painters and decorators, we've got heating engineers, we've got bus drivers, uh, we've got admin assistants, um, we've got property developers, you name it. If you can think of a job within the special constabulary, it's, it's probably there. But one of the things that's amazing is that over time, people go through different stages in their lives. So you know, when you're in your kind of those early, late teens, early 20s, it might be first relationships. Uh, it might be your first home. It could be getting your first car. And the thing that's interesting is that that has a different pull on people's time and availability. So some of our younger officers have loads of time, you know, they'll come in and do hundreds of hours uh, and then they'll meet someone and the hours will drop off because it's hello world. I'm in love. I want to be with them. Um, and then it, it sort of comes back maybe as the relationship grows or as it ends, that sort of comes back. Then you see people who have kids for the first time and the hours drop off, but they've done loads and loads of hours and put loads of time in. Um, then as you get older, still those, you know, getting married, maybe getting divorced. You know, so you see this kind of thing in people's lives. And I think what's amazing with the special constabulary is, particularly when you've got these career specials, you've done five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. When you see it, it doesn't surprise you, you know? And because of that, you get those times where someone's hours drop off, but they've done five, 10 years where they've put in everything. Well, we can definitely pay back to them by just taking the pressure off, take the time you need. You know, all that experience hasn't gone away. But I think when you're dealing with people through their lifetime, you have to expect that. And as a person within the special constabulary, you can expect that back. So it's not a case of, well, if this happens, we'll work through it. You know, if you've paid in, if you've done everything that you, you know, you've given 100%, you'll get that back. So do you find you see that the most then, the career specials, or is it a stepping stone for some yeah. to potentially, you know, an entry route for them to potentially become Without a... question. Try before you buy, you know, is one of the beauties of, of, of this, is that you can get a real kind of sense of what policing's like, what the environment's like, what you're going to experience day in, day out. It's not the same as everything uh, in, in terms of the regulars, but it's a good 95% of it. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a real stepping stone for, for many. But actually, we have a huge tranche of people that are career specials. And, and some of it's been the same way as it happened for me. They come in, maybe economics takes over. 
and it just kind of works better. And I think that's one of the things Kent does well because the amount of things we can get involved in, you don't feel like it's a trade-off. Mm -hmm. You can have both. Um, so yeah, that works well. And you mentioned that, you know, there's a real variety of people, you know, from all different roles um, as specials in the county. I mean, that must mean that businesses are pretty supportive then for people to do this in their spare time or maybe take some time off, do some flexible working. Absolutely. Do you find that, you know, businesses are well, The businesses I've worked supportive. in since I joined over the 30 years, all of them have been very pro me doing this. Um, whether it's I, I might need time off for court. Uh, a lot of them have never insisted I take holiday, for instance. They kind of see there's a benefit to me from a, a leadership standpoint. And a, I talked about communication and perspective. I've been able to add more and more perspective to meetings or to situations um, as a consequence of policing, you know. And, and I think it helps if one of the reasons I... I'm quite calm in most situations, even in kind of corporate situations. It's because that perspective is nobody's dying in what we're doing here. <laughs> you know, we, this is about usually money, it's either cost or revenue. Let's just slow down. You know, it's not the same as being at the side of the road with somebody doing CPR. So let's just put it in perspective. But one of the things I, I when I first, the first kind of shift I ever went on, I remember sitting in the parade room eight or nine officers came in with the sergeant and they went through something which is fairly standard, which is basically the call signs uh, and the officers that were gonna be assigned to it. Well, if you don't know any officers, so you don't know their names, you don't even know, you know what a call sign is, but you don't know what the call signs are. You have no clue what's happening. Uh, and it was really uncomfortable. It wasn't the people, they didn't do that. No one knows you. Um, and it was a few of those types of things that made me kind of decide I'd like to be a tutor because I think there's a gap between the training we get, the training you then get on your division, but the bit in the middle where someone takes you through the operational stuff. So we're gonna go in here and we're gonna sit down. The team will come in in a minute and you're gonna get assigned a call sign and a, and a, and a name of somebody who you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna introduce you to them and, and this is what's gonna happen. This is where you're gonna go and get your equipment and your kit. Here is a car. <laughs> this is what works in this particular car. This is what we do. Because that gap for me was missing. Sure. So you identified that opportunity and then how did you take that forward? I just, you know, I made sure that when, you know, any, any new officers joined us, we would do a, an on-site induction at the police station itself and I would take them into the briefing room first. And for instance, on the walls, would normally be names of offenders and pictures and how they're linked to other people, but they would have a, a little drawstring blind that you'd pull down because it's sensitive data. Well, if you didn't know that was there, you wouldn't even know what that information was or why you looked at it. And then the names that would get called out at the briefing by the sergeant, oh, you need to look out for Joe Bloggs. Well, who the hell's Joe Bloggs? Here's Joe Bloggs. <laughs> this is where he lives. This is what he looks like. Here are his friends. So you're helping people to knit those sorts of things together. Uh, right, let's go out to a car. There's no pressure because we're not going out anywhere. Here is the uh, PR set, because we used to have two radios at the time in the car. Here is the main county set. We don't really use that, but you need to have it on. We use this all the time. So when you get in the car, you switch that on and you switch your radio off because it is your radio, it just saves the battery. All the small operational bits like today, for instance, to get into any of our car radios, you have to put in a certain code. Well, what if no one tells you the code? Sure. So you being an officer out there, you can establish what they would need to know and you can kind of fill those gaps. Because I want them to feel comfortable. So how do you make people feel welcome? Mm -hmm. How do you make people feel as comfortable as they can do? And most people think they're at fault. You know, we apologise. As a nation, we apologise for, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, sorry, but how do we, I'm so sorry. It's down to yeah, us don't be sorry. Yes. to make it work for them. And they're volunteers. You know, they are volunteers. Even if they were paid, I was to do the same thing. But they are volunteers. And I guess for you, moving from Gravesend to a central role with traffic means you can move around the county too. So you're not yes. only getting a different type of work experience, you're actually getting to work in other areas of the county, which has got to be helpful when it comes to building up that experience. Absolutely, but it puts you back in the same position as the person that joins. Sure. Because you go to a different custody suite, 
and they all work slightly differently. The premise is the same. Uh, you go to look for a computer to do your statement. Where's that? Oh, it's upstairs in that office. No idea where that is. Um, so you kind of put yourself in, 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 in those situations. But sometimes it's only by putting yourself in those situations that you feel that discomfort that you kind of learn more. And um, I think that's one of the things that made us successful at Gravesend as we built our cadre of specials, really operationally capable specials, and built our reputation with our regular colleagues. Um, and then we used the same thing when we started up the RPU. And so let's talk about the fact that you have a full-time job, you have a personal life, you're also volunteering. How do you balance all of that? Well, I don't know anything When do different. you sleep? I do, <laughs> I do, I do sleep. Um, I, I don't know anything different. I joined when I was 24. I'm just coming up for 54 next year. So for the last kind of 30 years, I've always wanted to do this. You know, some people go and watch football. Some people go and play football. For some people, it's they go to the pub. You know, for other people, uh, they'll go to restaurants. It's whatever their thing is, this is my thing. So I don't, I come to do this for a rest is probably the best way I can put it. Yeah, because it's completely different to the day job. Um, and so your, you know, your mind is occupied in a very different way. Um, the people you're engaging with, the situations that you're in, uh, it's, it's completely different. And I kind of know myself, if I, if I wake up in the morning and I think, oh, I'm not going in because that's my signal to me that is like, if I'm not fully enthused about it, my body's kind of going, or my head is going, you need some time, so mm. don't go. Um, but that's taken years mm. to kind of, to know that. And I think policing's quite seasonal as well. So in that, there are, when you first join, you do as many hours as you possibly can. Mm. Uh, the upside of that is you get quite a lot of experience quite rapidly. The downside of that is you think you've got a lot of experience and you haven't, but you feel like you have. Um, and because I have this, personally, this view of policing being quite seasonal in terms of the shift patterns you do. So a lot of specials do nighttime economy. So they'll do the, the, the late to night shift. Well, doing earlies is a very different policing proposition. Lates is quite a different policing proposition. So if you don't experience all of those things, you can come away thinking policing is this, when actually it's this. And it's, this, mm. and it's this, and it's this, and it's this, and it's this, and it's this. And presumably every day is different. I mean, to your point, policing is tough. Yeah. Um, and you do get a rest from it in yep. your day job, whereas um, regular officers would not. So I don't know whether that's a selling point for being a special. Well, I think so. You know, you get that experience that you can then translate into your everyday life and your everyday job. But... You, you're giving something back to the community as well, and you're learning. Yeah, well, if you take the, that, that point around the police, the public, and the public are the police, I think special constables are the absolute embodiment of that. Um, and so we really kind of walk and straddle that line of both. Now, obviously, every police officer is a member of the public at the same time. But you're also a product of your environment, and you're a product of kind of what goes on around you. And so... One of the things about moving to roads policing is that you are suddenly exposed far more greatly to the general public again. One of the things when you're kind of doing the operational divisional 999 policing is a lot of the time you're just dealing with the same people. The same people again and again and again. The same criminals again and again and again and again and again. And they're kind of outer circle who are usually not particularly pro-police. So it's very easy to feel that Everybody hates you. Everybody hates the police. That's just not the case. Mm. And then you, you then sort of roll that over with social media and the algorithms. And then you suddenly believe where it, literally the whole world is against you. And it's just not the case. And I think from one of the things I found going to roads policing was that actually I, I deal with on any given shift. Most people have had a bad day. So if we go to a, a, some sort of prang, some sort of collision, most people have just had a bad day. You know, and, and it's their one collision maybe in their lifetime or in a decade it might have been our third that day and you have to look after them and treat them and investigate and do everything you need to do as if it's never happened before um equally you know you might somebody who's just who's gone too fast for whatever the reason not a bad person not a criminal 
Um, and you've got to deal with that. And some people will thank you at the end of that. Uh, and some people won't. Um, someone's picked up their phone. Now, we all kind of know, don't do that. But I've dealt with many people who are perfectly nice, decent people mm. who either didn't know <laughs> or just had a moment of madness. Um, but what you find is that most of the time, the public are pretty pro. The public are pretty pro. And they're good at a lot of stuff for us. Um, I remember not long after... Um, the officer was killed at the Houses of Parliament. Um, we uh, had breakfast one Saturday morning, my team. It was a, a, an all-out day. And we went to have breakfast at a, a cafe, as we sometimes do, just to kind of catch up with each other. And as we were chatting, um, this party got up from another table to leave. And I was sat on the edge of the table next to the walkway. And this woman, as she just passed me, she just put her hand on my shoulder. Didn't do anything else. She just patted my shoulder and carried on walking. How does that make you feel? Well, that particular time, because it was so soon, um, my colleagues who were facing me stopped eating and went, what was that? And I said, I think that said thanks. Um, That's really nice. And, and it was just, just mm. a little moment, you know, and I, I think broadly speaking, you know, the public are great. If Rose Pulitzer, they're brilliant at phoning stuff in on the motorway, debris on the motorway. I don't know who teaches them that. I wasn't taught in my driving test. No, no, but they are phenomenal at phoning us up to go, there's a stepladder there, or there's a, a ratchet strap, or there's an old bit of tyre. Um, and they also want to get out of your way. You know, so when you are mm. driving on blue lights to stuff, if you give them the time, yeah, there's always someone who'll do something silly, but if you give them the time, they will get out of your way. So the public, broadly speaking, you know, I think they are all pretty pro. Have you had moments in your career where you thought, actually, this is a bit of a risk. I'm actually a bit scared for my life. Um, I don't know that you think about, I don't know that you think about the risks 99% of the time. Um, I think the first time you go very fast in a police car, particularly on the roads policing side, there is a moment your brain goes, well, what if the tire bursts now? What's going to happen? Um, so, over time that kind of goes away because you realize the checks that the, that the officers do and the level of training etc but you're also acutely aware that you know you there's only so much you can do you know and, and, and when people have gone before you have lost their lives and they might have been better than you then you know you you, you kind of you just do the best you can do and how do you manage the impact um, the emotional impact that the job has i've been i've been lucky because you can be at the wrong place at the, at the wrong time and you can have all the communication skills in the world there are people who want to do officers harm for no other reason than just and it doesn't matter so that's why i say i'm kind of lucky um but i think when you hear of colleagues when you hear of friends who have been hurt uh, one of my uh, colleagues back in the day at Gravesend was stabbed uh, and it was his vest that saved him. And it was as simple as knocking on the door, a door opening and a knife. There was no other conversation. Um, that's what I talk about lucky, you know. Um, I don't, you'd have to ask everyone, I, I don't really think about it is the honest answer. Because I think if you gave it too much thought, you probably wouldn't. Do you feel you can talk to your colleagues though? Oh, without you question. Can talk to each other about it, vent and Oh, yes, and learn. Humor. I think what's interesting as I've got older and particularly now looking after um, the operational side for our team is our younger officers. Um, you kind of look back and see yourself back then. And so it's encouraging them to actually talk. Um, and one of my colleagues went to a, quite a nasty um, collision that ended up being a fatality. Uh, and he's young in service and another officer who I don't know as well isn't on our team but was at the same job another special constable who messaged me to say this person I think could do with a call so I phoned him and he was still at the job and I went are you okay and he was like yeah I could hear he was shaking he went I'm a bit shaken but yes I'm okay and I said so listen you know whatever you've done you have done the best you can do. And it wasn't till later I watched his body worn video back and I saw the extent to what he had to deal with mm. at that age, at that length of service. And you just feel 
really impressed and a, and a, and a degree of pride for him as an individual, uh, for the team. Um, and you get a sense of just what, what would I have done there with my service? What would I have done? And how do I add value to him without second guessing him? And self reflection is very important, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's um, how we learn. Yes. And that you get taught a lot about that particularly through the various kinds of training that we get, whether it's around um, use of force, whether it's around our our driving and our reflection, those officers who go and get on a taser, etc. Self-reflection is huge in policing, absolutely huge. And if you've got the ability to do that and criticise yourself, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but in a sense of, "Mm, maybe I've done that, or maybe I could have done this. You know, you're laying down the blueprint for the future Mm -hmm. as opposed to, it is what it is, you know. I, I could. What, what else could I do? You know, that's too easy. That's too easy. You're letting yourself down with that. Mm. Um, uh, you, you've got to be able to re- reflect. You don't have to tell everyone else, but you've got to be able to do it. And thirty years—that's that's a long time. That's a long time to dedicate um, your services to Kent Police, and that's commendable. Um, there must have been a lot of moments that you can recall that that have been a a high for you but is there any one time that you recall that's a a standout moment oh there's there's quite a few um but they're for different reasons so one of my i don't know favorites the right word um one moment very relatively early on was uh just one of those days driving from gravesend to blue water to go and walk around blue water for the day um and as we came off the a2 at um at bean there was a coach parked kind of on the roundabout uh, and an ambulance in front of it. Well, we stop, right? It was just, and so we got out and we went to speak to the ambulance crew and couldn't find them. They were on the coach and there was a man on the coach who was having a heart attack and the ambulance crew were dealing with that. And he was conscious and he was breathing, but he was having a heart attack and they were trying to work out how they were going to get him off the coach uh, because he couldn't stand. So they decided they were going to get a backboard and we were trying to work it out. And in the end, we decided we'd open the rear kind of fire exit that there used to be, which would open out onto the roundabout and onto the road. So we kind of ran out, stopped all the traffic on the roundabout. How many of you were there? Just the two of us. Just two. And um, we kind of held the stretcher because those coaches are quite tall. Both of us were quite tall. We kind of, as they, as, as the ambulance crew fed the stretcher out, we kind of held it above our heads and then we had to wait for one of them to come out. And we walked back and we eventually kind of lowered it and we popped it on the on the stretcher on the ground and the public were, as they normally are actually, were fantastic. Uh, do you need any help? Do you need any help? Do you need any help? Um, and then I looked down at the, the, the man who was having the heart attack and he was just he was just kind of just looking up at me and his eyes were and he just grabbed my hand and he squeezed my hand. And I squeezed his and I kind of looked at him and in my head I went, what, what do you say now? Because uh, you don't want to be kind of, I don't know, twee, you don't want to be flippant about it, but you also don't want to be negative and you don't want to. So um, I said, you're going to be absolutely fine. I said, oh, you may not know this, but you are literally five minutes from the hospital, Darenth Valley Hospital. I said, and they're fabulous at this kind of stuff. I said, you're going to be absolutely fine. And he didn't really say much. He just kept squeezing my hand. So I walked him to the ambulance, well, I didn't walk him, I walked with him to the ambulance and we got him on. And then I was just trying to get him to let go of my hand. Um, and then off they went. Well, he obviously felt very safe with you, which is great because sometimes with policing, if you turn up at the door, it's for a reason that perhaps isn't in favour of the person answering the no, door. No. And their experience of liaising with you is not going to be a positive one. You know, when paramedics turn up, they're there essentially to save your life. Yes. Um, it's good that you can work with partners like that to help protect people. That's and the I thing. think to be able to say that the public, you know, to, you've given some examples of the public um, being really happy with the service and happy with the work that you've done. That's really reassuring. Do you find that's reassuring to hear? Yeah, well, because I, again, I think it's just too easy to be the product of the environment and not to look beyond it. If you're constantly arresting people, which is part of the job, you're going to experience conflict and negativity at times, but you can still respect people. 
you know, and I've often found that you can be rolling around on the floor with someone, you get them into handcuffs and you're like, right, we're all over, mate, let's just get you into custody, we'll get you a cup of tea, etc., etc. And so much of the time that will just decompress mm. something. Or I can remember talking to one guy who was, uh, he said he was going to fail the breath test and then when he did, he was going to kick off. And I remember, I said to him, okay, so we'll put a couple of things. I said, one, let's just do the breath test. Let's put that. I said, but secondly, I don't know about you. I said, but I'm getting too old for rolling around on the floor. I said, and look, and the other thing is simply this. By all means, if you kick off, that's up to you. I said, but has that ever worked? Like, have we ever gone, well, all right then. We, we, we. And uh, I just gave him a, a, you know, a little wink and a little bit of a smirk. Could have gone either way. He went, oh, just give us a thing. He did it. He failed. He went, come on then. I walked around and got into the back of the van. You but you know, must have learned how to do that because obviously there's a skill, isn't there, in trying to diffuse a situation with words, which I would imagine is what we all want to be able to do in the first instance. What I tend to think is if I were them, now not me as Terry, but if I were them in their situation, what would I think? Mm. What, is, what, what do I want out of this? You know, and we grow up on a council estate uh, and uh, it was quite rough and um, we, the other half of our family is from Ireland and they grew up on a really rough council estate and they uh, had interactions with the police and I remember going on holiday being around that and all of those people thought they were in the right and they weren't bad people you know it was it was the police were the enemy but they were all good people and they were in the right, even though probably some of them were doing bad stuff. And, and you know, so sometimes when you go onto estates or I'd go to places where I recognise that, I kind of think to them, they are that. So the worst thing I can do, and it's not to say at times you, you don't have to be firm and all of those things, is to behave in the way they expect me to. Mm. And actually to be able to just kind of talk to people because it's, they see the uniform. You know, and so much of the time you'll meet, or certainly back in the day, I would meet people I'd arrested a couple of times and you'd show up, go, look. Back again. Here we go. So what's it going to be? I'll be reasonable, you know. Mm. Um, and you see that with regular officers as well. Mm. They're just people who have got an innate skill with people. In diffusing situations. Or, or even situations. preventing them escalating. Yeah. Or get so-and-so. If you get so-and-so, I'll go to the van. Now, there's, that's a, you know, a blessing and a curse. On the one hand great. On the other hand, you're not in control. So you don't get to dictate what we do, because that's a big thing. But then time also teaches you that, well, sometimes that person's already on their way. So let's just, doesn't have to kick off. Let's just take a minute and, you know, we're going to be sat here anyway. Let's just wait and we'll just walk them in. So everybody has their way. So going back to your team, so you're a special, yep. you work with the regular officers as well. Yep. Um, what's the um, camaraderie like in your, in your team? Do you all get on well? Our specials team, really well. So um, it's the best team I've worked with in the police. But again, that is because I have learned from seeing other really good teams in the police. Um, and the first team of regulars that I worked with back in Gravesend, uh, who were called four section, you were either a section or a team, they were a section, uh, who I worked with almost exclusively for that 14 years. I worked with or saw several sergeants come through that team who just embodied really great leadership. And none of them were professionally trained. You know, uh, they, they were all just people people. Learned from experience. Kind of, yeah. What skills would you say you have acquired in your policing career and vice versa as well in your, um, you know, private business career? And how have you used those um, to benefit both, both sides, if you like? I think two things that policing gives you is perspective uh, and communication. You know, perspective in that you you kind of have to be able to look at all situations from 360 degrees. So if you were to think of a bicycle wheel with a hub in the middle and the various spokes, to be able to look at this situation from that perspective or that perspective or that perspective or that perspective. But that's also comes from my kind of professional life as well, where you might be negotiating or you would think about negotiating and you kind of think, okay, well, what, what does this group want from this? 
and how do I sit myself in their position? And what do we want from this? And what's that? And then what's someone else's position? What's someone else's position? What's someone else's position? So I think that's, that's really important. Um, it's the same as, you know, the perspective of when you're building relationships with our regular colleagues. Um, you know, the roads policing, uh, similar to some of our other specialisms where specials are involved, we broadly get all the same training as our regular colleagues do. So you could say we're trained to exactly the, at the same level. I could say we receive the same training. Are we trained to the same level? At the point that we have the training, yes, but we don't do it as often as them when you think about day in, day out. Also, I think the perspective sometimes that when you come in as a special constable, you might, have come, you might come in weekly, you might come in fortnightly. Um, but the, the way I normally try and share this with my, my special colleagues is, imagine in your day job, if this volunteer showed up periodically when you didn't know when they were coming. They sat at your desk, they drank coffee from your mug, they used your computer, they messed the settings up on your chair to make it comfortable for them, and then they disappeared. And then in a week or two's time, they were back again, just after you got everything set, and they did it again. If you don't have a relationship with them, what are you going to feel about them? You know, and that is what we do with our regular colleagues when we come in, is that we appear. Now, if we've got really great relationships, Terry, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. What's going on? Blah, 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 blah. If you haven't, who are you? Mm. And, and it's not negative. It's like, I don't know you, so I don't know what you're capable of. I don't, who do I put you with? Are you okay to be out on your own? All of those things. So the relationship piece becomes everything. Now marry that with communication. So understanding that from a communication standpoint, if I spend time with all of these people over time, we're going to connect, it's going to happen. We're gonna have conversation. We're gonna, I'm gonna know more about you. You're gonna know more about me. We're gonna do this policing thing along the way and understand what we're both good at and not good at. Um, but also, the sergeants are gonna see me more. They're gonna see me at jobs. They're gonna know what I can and can't do. Great, you know, and, and that reputation and that trust and confidence. I think it's the, it's the US Secret Service, Service, their motto is worthy of trust and confidence. They have that on their shields. That for me is kind of what it's about being a special within the regulars. Are you, not from your own standpoint, but from their standpoint, are you worthy of trust and confidence? What would you say to somebody who is considering signing up to the special constabulary? Oh, if, if you're thinking about it, just do it. Just do it. You can't lose. You can't lose. It is, and I'm not, this isn't to say policing, but, but it is the greatest show on earth. And are you glad you did it for so long and you didn't take the step to become a police officer? I'm very, very pleased I didn't become a regular officer. Um, I think I genuinely have the best of both worlds. Um, I have nothing but admiration for the regs because I couldn't do what they do every day. As much as every day is different, uh, the level of resilience that you need to have, um, the, the, the constant change in policing and what's expected and what's required, whether that's the expectation of government, whether that's the expectation of uh, the public, whether that's the expectation of different factions of the public, whether it's the expectations of the force, or a force, any force. Most of us in our day jobs will make mistakes and no one's really gonna know, mm. you know, our boss. And it'll be, oh yeah, I'm going to do that, blah, 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 blah. We seem to not accept that our emergency services and other kind of public bodies should be able to make mistakes, mm. you know? And, and so that pressure that's out there, um, particularly in a world that's socially networked, which I certainly didn't have when we kind of started, um, the ability of everybody filming at all times, which can be great. There's a lot of pros to that as well. Um, that's significant. It can add to the pressure too. Can't without it? question, mm. without question. And, and you know, and you only have to look at the London Bridge attacks and that uh, PC, um, from the BTP who took on all three attackers were just with his baton, severely, severely injured, off-duty PCs running into stuff with no, 
they'll all do that. Mm. They'll all do that, you know. And and so I think about the people that I've worked with over the years, whether I know them really well or you just show up to a job because somebody's pressed the button. Um, and I look at now so many young officers co sort of coming in and you think, this, you know, this is the future. And it's too easy to go, well, I wouldn't have done that. And back in the day, well, we lived at a different time, mm. you know. So I think the pressure t today is just... Really, significantly really, higher. You must have seen a lot of changes just in society, not well, just police. Absolutely, or... yeah. I mean, we had no mobile phones when we started. Um, there was no, you know, social media. Um, the explosion in calls when we got mobile phones became, you know, prolific. What best describes your career? Um, not in a grand way, but life-changing, because it kind of really has changed my life. Um, Rewarding, I think everyone will say that, but yes, really, really rewarding. Um, it's kind of a privilege, really, because I've got to do things that you couldn't pay to do. And admittedly, I didn't get paid to do them, <laughs> but, but a privilege. But you do it because you love it. And that is the thing. When people say, thank you for your service, all of that kind of stuff, don't forget, I've got a huge amount out of it. So we're now going into our off-the-cuff segment, something a little bit different. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. What is your go-to snack when you're on duty? Okay, this is a sausage and cheese stick, usually on tiger bread. It is from Sue's. Uh, uh, you know, other, other establishments are available. But Sue's tea van on the A228, just close to Junction 4 of the M20. And a tea with two sugars. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. And, and if, Nigel. Nigel cooks it. Sue serves it. It's a team effort. Brilliant. And if you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Time travel. Time travel. Uh, I mean, that could get very complicated. But let's just for now say time travel. Excellent. And if you could choose any celebrity to join you on a shift, who would it be? Michael McIntyre. And why? Michael McIntyre all day To long. make you laugh. Definitely to make me laugh, uh, without question. Um, I think I would just be, I'd be, I think we'd end up giving him a raft of material for a new <laughs> show. But yeah, definitely him. What's one thing you wish the public knew about a special constable? Just this kind of ripple effect that you have. And I think, you know, there's this story about um, this, this chap running up a beach and it's a beautiful morning and he's running up the beach, he's got his headphones in. And uh, I always think of it's in California, I don't know where it was. But anyway, as he's running, he can see this little girl in the distance and she's sort of bending down to the sand and then she's throwing things into the sea. And he, as he gets a bit closer, he can see a mum sort of sat on a dune looking at it all. And as he starts to, to see what's in front of him, it is thousands and thousands and thousands of starfish have been washed up on the, on the, on the beach. And uh, he can see the little girl picking up starfish and just throwing them back into the water. So as he sort of comes up to it, takes his headphones out, looks at mum, sort of just kind of nods. And he says, what are you doing? And she says, oh, I'm throwing the starfish back into the water because they've all been washed up and they're going to die. So he, he looks at the literally the thousands of it and he went, but there's thousands of them. What difference are you going to make? So she picks up this starfish, throws it into the water and says, made a difference to that one. And that is it really in a nutshell. You know, you can look at everything and go, too hard, too difficult. What, what, what difference will it make? You know, you speak to somebody who's had their life saved by a St. John's Ambulance volunteer or by the life folks. Made a difference to that one. Mm -hmm. You know, what about the people uh, who, who, members of the public who step in to help someone else? No training. Made a difference to that one. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's it. It's like, it's just about do something. Like, by all means, everyone has an opinion on everything. But it's really easy to comment from the sideline. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 Take a come chance. and put a uniform on mm. and come and understand it and do your bit because you'll do something positive. You'll do something positive. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, volunteering is incredibly selfless and the force are very lucky to have you. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, follow us on Instagram, X, Facebook and LinkedIn, where we'll be posting previews of our upcoming episodes. 
Don't forget you can watch this episode by subscribing to our YouTube channel and find out more about the variety of career opportunities available by searching Kent Police Careers. Bye for now.